The challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on your husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. The Northern Lights Cafe in Dawson City was crowded with its usual motley array of customers. Bearded prospectors and trappers rubbed shoulders with eager gold rushers newly arrived in the territory. Among the men lined up at the bar was a big, broad-shouldered young miner named Ed Russell. A friend standing next to him was saying, Well, Ed, how's that claim of yours panning out? I hear you struck it pretty rich. I sure did, Sam. My claim is really loaded. But it looks like I may have to sell out. Well, how come? My little boy's not very well. The climate doesn't seem to agree with him. The doctor told us we ought to take him back to the States. Well, that's too bad, Ed. I'm sorry to hear it. The trouble is, I can't get a decent price for my claim. How much are you asking for? I don't aim to take less than $10,000 for it. But so far, the best offer I've had is only $5,000. $10,000 is a pretty steep price. Well, it's worth all of that and probably a lot more. I'm telling you, Sam, I wouldn't be surprised but what that claim is good for $20,000. Two men seated at a nearby table had overheard the conversation between Ed and Sam. One of them nudged the other. Hey, Max, you hear what that young guy was saying just now? Yeah, he's got a rich claim and he wants a sellout. He's asking 10000 bucks for it. Well, we can afford to pay him ten grand or even fifty grand if necessary. <laughs> this counterfeit money ain't doing us no good in our pockets. <laughs> just what I was thinking. Why don't we have a little talk with him? Good idea. All right, you stay here. I'll bring him over to the table. I don't like the idea of selling out at a loss, but I may have to do it. Yeah. Tommy's health is worth a lot more to me than the price yeah. of my claim. Uh, excuse me, mister, but I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Art Lusk. Glad to know you. I'm Ed Russell. I happen to overhear what you were saying about selling your claim. My partner and I would like to talk business with you. You mean you're interested in buying me out? That's right. How about coming over to our table and talking it over? Uh, sure. Where's your partner? Right over there. That bald-headed gent sitting by himself. Okay. Excuse me a minute, will you, Sam? Sure, sure. Go right ahead. Well, here we are. Oh, Ed, I'd like to have you meet my partner, Max Delmar. Max, this is Ed Russell. Well, howdy, young fella. Pull up a chair. Thanks. I, uh, understand you've got a rich claim and you want to sell out. That's right. But I don't know whether you can meet my price. I'm asking 10000 for it. Now, don't you worry about that. If your claim's worth it, we'll pay you ten grand for it. In cash? Absolutely. Cash on the barrel head. In that case, I don't see why we can't make a deal. Uh, where's your claim located? It's ten below Discovery on Siwash Creek. All right, I'll tell you what. Suppose we come out to your place tomorrow morning and look the claim over. If it's as rich as you say it is, we'll come back here to Dawson, draw up a contract, and close the deal. Fair enough, mister. Let's shake on that. Why, sure. That evening, when Ed Russell returned to his cabin on Siwash Creek, his wife was just setting the table for supper. Hi, honey. Ed, darling. You're just in time for supper. Mmm, smells mighty good, too. The house, Tommy. He's a lot better. His cough's almost gone. He's sleeping now. Ah, oh, that's good. If he shakes off this cold, let's hope he can stay well for a while. I just dread going through another winter up here. Tommy needs a good long spell in a warm climate in order to build up his resistance. Well, looks as though we won't have to spend another winter up here. What, what do you mean? I found a buyer for the claim. Ed, did you really? I should say two buyers, to be exact. Their names are Max Delmar and Art Lusk. Oh. They're coming out tomorrow morning to look the claim over. And if everything's satisfactory, we'll go back to town and close the deal. Oh, I can hardly wait. Just think. In another week, we may be on our way back home to the state. With $10,000 in our pockets. Enough to live comfortably for a change and give us a real start in life. Oh, yeah, honey, I, I guess we have a lot to be thankful for. The following morning in Dawson City, Sergeant Preston was called into the office of Inspector Conrad. 
You wanted to see me, Inspector? Yes, Sergeant. I've just had word from the United States Treasury Department that two American counterfeiters may be hiding out here in the territory. Well, who are they, sir? Their names are Max Delmar and Arthur Lusk. We have descriptions of them, but no photographs. Has any counterfeit money turned up in the territory? No, yet, Sergeant. Delmar and Lusk were members of a counterfeiting ring that was broken up in the States a few months ago. They were the only ones who escaped. Well, how did the American authorities trace them up here? Well, it's known that they boarded a ship in Seattle that was bound for Skagway. That means there's a good chance that they were heading for the Yukon Territory. They have any counterfeit money in their possession? Yes, Sergeant. According to the members of the ring who were captured, Delmar and Lusk were carrying nearly $100,000 in counterfeit currency. Huh. Probably think it'll be easy to pass up here in the Yukon. The Treasury Department sent along an exact description of the counterfeit bills. I want you to circulate this information to all the banks and business houses in Dawson. Very well, sir. I'll get busy right away. Here's the full report, Sergeant. You can study it for yourself. Let me know as soon as you get any leads. Right, Inspector. Come along, Ken. Oh, oh. That afternoon, Ed Russell came to Dawson and signed the deed of sale, which transferred ownership of the claim to the two crooks. By the way, do you mind if we take a day or so to clear out of the cabin? It'll take a little while to get ready for the trip back to the States. Not at all, not at all. Take two or three days, if you like. Oh, thanks, that's mighty nice of you. Well, I'd better be going, I guess. So long. So long, and good luck to you. <laughs> Yeah, so long, sucker. I hope he don't take too long clearing out of the territory. Max, you think there's any danger of those bills being spotted as phony? Nah, not a chance. Took the Secret Service a year to get wise to us back in the States. Up here in the Yukon, they'll never be able to tell these bills from the real thing. I guess you're right. Look, we'll buy up some more claims, sell them off as fast as we can. In a couple of months, we can make ourselves a fortune. After leaving the hotel, Ed went to the Yukon Territorial Bank to deposit the $10,000. Uh, how much you got there, Ed? $10,000. I suppose you want to count it out. Well, that's right. <laughs> Not that I don't trust you. Say, wait a minute. What's the matter? Well, this money's counterfeit, Ed. Well, counterfeit? Are you sure? I'm positive. Sergeant Preston came around to the bank just this morning and warned us to be on the lookout for bills like these. Why, those dirty skunks. They were trying to swindle me. Who was it gave you the money? A couple of smooth gents named Max Delmar and Art Lusk. I just made over my claim to them. They've got the deed of sale all signed and witnessed. Well, we better report this counterfeit money to the Mounties right away, Ed. Don't worry. I'll report the whole thing to the Mounties. But first, I'm going over to the Palace Hotel and get back that deed of sale. And while I'm there, I'm going to give Delmar and Lusk something to remember me by. Boiling with rage over the way the two crooks had tried to swindle him, Ed Russell hurried back to the Palace Hotel. Without bothering to knock, he burst into their room. Hey, what's the idea? What do you think, you dirty skunks? I just found out that money you paid me was counterfeit. Hey, what? You, you, what? Oh, you did, huh? And uh, just how did you find that out? The bank teller spotted it, that's how. Now hurry up and hand over that deed of sale you swindled me into signing. Calm down, calm down. Suppose we give you back that deed of sale. What do you intend to do? Look, if you keep your mouth shut and not go squawking to the police, we might be willing to make a deal with you. Don't try to bribe me, Delmar. As soon as I get that deed of sale, I'm going to give you and your partner a little going over just for good measure. And then I'm going to report those counterfeit bills to the Montes. So that's your attitude, huh? Yeah, that's my attitude. Well, in that case, you're not leaving us much choice. What? Get your hands up, Russell. Gun. Yeah, it's a gun, all right, and it's loaded, too. And you let out a yell for help, and I'll blast you to kingdom come. Now, turn around. What are you going to do? Turn around and find out. That's better. Now, I'll show you what I'm going to do. No. You laid them out cold, Max. Yeah, there's no telling how long you'll stay that way. Better rip up the bed sheets, tie them up, and gag him. Good idea. A few minutes later, the two crooks finished tying and gagging the unconscious man. There, that ought to hold him. Now, what are we going to do, Max? I don't know. I don't know. We're in a bad spot. Looks like we better pull our freight before the Mounties get on our trail. The trouble is, we need dough. We got plenty of counterfeit. Oh, fat lot of good that'll do us once the Mounties get wise to us. They'll spread the word all over the territory to be on the lookout for phony bills. Yeah, I guess you're right. Hey, I got an idea. Let's hear it. We still got the deed of sale giving us ownership of Russell's claim. If we can sell the claim in a hurry, we can pick ourselves up a few thousand bucks and then make our getaway. Well, it'll take time to find a buyer. Well, maybe not. They got mine brokers up here that make a business of buying and selling claims. We can go to one of them and take any price he'll give us. Yeah, I guess that's better than nothing. Come on, let's go. Right. 
Later that afternoon, the bank teller from the Yukon Territorial Bank came to Mounted Police Headquarters. He found Sergeant Preston seated in the office with the great dog, Yukon King, curled up beside his desk. Oh, hello, Frank. Uh, hello, Sergeant. Uh, has Ed Russell been here yet? Not that I know of. I just came in a few minutes ago. Why? Well, he showed up at the bank an hour or so ago with $10,000 in counterfeit bills. In that case, I'm sure he hasn't been in. The constable on duty would have notified me. Well, the bills were the kind you warned us to watch out for. Did Ed tell you where he got them? Yes, he sold his claim. The $10,000 was the money he got paid for it. Strange he hasn't come around to headquarters. You say where he was going when he left the bank? Well, I told him to report to you right away. But he was pretty mad. He said first he was going to get back the deed of sale from the men he sold the claim to and give them something to remember him by. No wonder he hasn't shown up. You mean maybe something's happened to him? The counterfeiters who gave him that money are wanted criminals. They might kill to keep from getting caught. Great, Scott. I, I never thought of that. I should have come here before, but I assumed that Ed would report the matter to you. No need to blame yourself. Ed did a very foolish thing. I don't suppose he gave you any information about the man who gave him the money. Well, as a matter of fact, he did. He said the names were, uh, uh, let me see. Oh, yes, uh, Delmar and Lusk. Max Delmar and Arthur Lusk. Those are the counterfeiters, all right. Yeah, and he said he was going to see them at the Palace Hotel. I guess that's where they're staying. I'd better get over there right away. Well, let me go with you, Sergeant. If anything's happened, Ed, I'd feel partly responsible. I want to find out if he's all right. All right, wait till I get my pocket. Come on, King, let's go, boy. <laughs> when Sergeant Preston arrived at the Palace Hotel, he found out from the desk clerk that Delmar and Lusk had left the hotel about an hour ago, but hadn't checked out. The sergeant obtained a pass key from the clerk and went up to their room to investigate. Well, here's their room right here, Sergeant. Yes, the desk clerk said it was 2.13. I'll open the door. Holy mackerel! Well, it's Ed, and he's all tied up. Take it easy, Ed. I'll soon get this gag off you. There you go. Thanks, Sergeant. Thanks a lot. That gag was down near suffocating me. Well, thank goodness you're still alive. We were halfway expecting to find you dead. I'll cut through this stuff they tied you up with. How did you happen to come here? Well, I told the sergeant about that counterfeit money you got for your claim. And he suspected right away you might have gotten in trouble. Luckily, Frank remembered you were going to the Palace Hotel. Otherwise, you might have been up here for a good long time. There. Thanks. It sure feels good to get loose again. I guess it was pretty dumb of me coming here by myself instead of going straight to you, Sergeant. It's never smart to take the law into your own hands, Ed. Dealing with criminals is the job of the police. I sure found that out. What happened? Well, I came here and got tough with them and tried to get back the deed of sale I'd signed. And Delmar pulled a gun on me. He knocked me out. In that case, I don't suppose you know where they've gone. I do know where they went, Sergeant. Oh? You see, I came to again while they were tying me up. But they didn't know it because I pretended I was still unconscious. I heard them talking to each other. What'd they say? Well, they figured they'd make a getaway fast. But apparently they didn't have much money except for the counterfeit bills they were carrying. So? So they decided to take the deed of sale I signed and go sell the claim to a mine broker for any price they could get. They didn't say which mine broker? No, I guess they were just going to stop in the first office they came to. Well, there's a dozen or more mine brokers' offices along Front Street. I'll try them all if necessary. You feel well enough to come with me, Ed? Sure. I feel okay, except for this lump on my head. All right, then. If you're ready, let's go. Come along, King. The first mine broker's office, which Sergeant Preston and Ed Russell came to, was operated by a man named Arnold Brewster. As the sergeant and Ed entered the office, they were greeted by Brewster's clerk. Hello there, Sergeant. Hello, Dave. Mr. Brewster in? No, he isn't. I'm afraid he won't be back till this evening. Can I help you? Well, perhaps. We're looking for two men who are trying to sell a claim on Siwash Creek. Do you know if they came in here? Are their names Max Delmore and Art Lusk? Those are the men, all right. They sure did come in here. In fact, that's where Mr. Brewster's gone. He went out to Siwash Creek with them to inspect the claim. Thanks, Dave. That's all we wanted to know. Come on, Ed. We'll get our teams and go after them. It was more than an hour later that the two crooks arrived at the claim on Siwash Creek. The mine broker, Arnold Brewster, was with them. Oh, 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 oh. We better go up to the cabin and let Mrs. Russell know we're here. Yeah. We'll borrow some digging tools from her so Mr. Brewster here can inspect the claim. Very well. Hello. Well, hello there, Sonny. I suppose you're Ed Russell's little boy, aren't you? Yes, sir. I'm Tommy Russell. Is your mother home? Sure. Come on in. Thank you. Hello there. Howdy, Mrs. Russell. I'm sorry to disturb you. Oh, you're not disturbing me. This is our day for visitors, I guess. 
Mr. Dunlap here arrived just before you did. Mr. Dunlap? Yes, I'd like to have you meet him. Oh. Mr. Dunlap, this is Mr. Delmar and his partner, Mr. Lovell. How do you do? Yeah, I'm glad to know you. Homer Dunlap's the name. I represent the Ace Mining Company. Well, I guess we've got some introducing to do ourselves. This gent we brought with us is Mr. Arnold Brewster. He's a mine broker from Dawson City. Uh, how are you, Mister? Uh, didn't my husband come back from town with you? Why, uh, no. No, he didn't, Mrs. Russell. I... I guess he wanted to deposit the money in the bank and do some shopping or something. Oh. He'll probably be along any time now. I see. You closed the deal for the claim, I take it. Yeah, that's right. Then I guess you're out of luck, Mr. Dunlap. Well, what do you mean? Well, I came here prepared to make the Russells an offer for the claim on behalf of the Ace Mining Company. But now that you and Mr. Lusk have bought the claim, naturally you won't be interested in selling it. Oh, as a matter of fact, we are interested in selling it. You are? Yes, yes. You see, right after we closed the deal with your husband, we, um... We got an urgent letter from the states that makes it necessary for us to leave the Yukon Territory. Oh. Well, that's why we brought Mr. Brewster out here, so he could look over the claim. Well, that's fine. If you and your partner are interested in selling the claim, I'll make you an offer right now. No, wait a minute, Dunlap. I didn't make this trip out from town just for my health. I'm here to bid on the claim, too. Well, we'll be glad to hear offers from both of you. Isn't that right, Max? Absolutely. I have no intention of engaging in any competitive bidding. I'm here to make you a fair offer. You can take it or leave it. All right, sir. Now, just what do you consider a fair offer? Well, I understand from Mrs. Russell that she were to pay her husband ten thousand for the claim. I'll top that with an offer of eleven thousand, leaving you a clear profit of one thousand dollars. How about you, Brewster? Eleven thousand five hundred. Uh, now, see here, Brewster. You've got no business making an offer like that. You haven't even examined the claim. If you offer eleven thousand, I automatically figure it's worth at least five hundred more than that. Uh. Very well. I'll raise my offer to 12000 Now, do you want to top that? Uh, I reckon before I go any higher, I'd better take a look at the claim. Uh, can you two gentlemen wait till then to hear my final offer? Why, sure, if uh, you don't take too long. Uh -huh. Art, uh, suppose you take Mr. Brewster out and show him the diggings. All right. I'll stay here with Mr. Dunlap. I guess Mrs. Russell won't mind if you borrow her husband's tools. Oh, of course not. They're out back in the woodshed. When Art Lusk and Brewster returned to the cabin after inspecting the claim, Homer Dunlap eyed the mine broker suspiciously. Well, what's the verdict? Before I commit myself, I'd like to know if that 12,000 represents Dunlap's final offer. That's none of your business. Go ahead and make your own offer. Very well. 12,500. 13,000. 13,500. Brewster, I'd like to wring your neck. I know what you're up to. I was looking out the window, and I saw you take that walk down the creek. What's he talking about, Art? Search me. While I was throwing out the gravel, Brewster took a stroll and talked to the miner on the next claim down the creek. Never mind that. Well done, Lap. Are you going to top my offer, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'll go 14000 Now, look here, you two. Dunlap is merely an agent for the Ace Mining Company. There's no telling whether or not they'll back up his offer. I'm speaking for myself, and I'm offering you 15000 <laughs> And what's more, I'll sign a contract with you right here now. If you're smart, you'll take my offer. Sounds pretty good to me. How about it, Max? Yeah, yeah, maybe Brewster's talking sense. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm carrying $20,000 in my wallet right now. That's the absolute limit that I'm empowered to offer you. Take it or leave it. You want to go any higher, Brewster? Uh, $20,000. No, no, I reckon you'll have to count me out. Confounded pirate. <laughs> All right, then, Dunlap, let's see the color of your money. We'll make over the claim to you right now. After the two crooks had produced the deed of sale and signed over the claim to the Ace Mining Company, Homer Dunlap counted out the money. There you are, $20,000. Thank you. Maybe now you m won't mind telling us why Brewster took that walk down the creek. The fact is, the Ace Mining Company is buying up claims all along the creek in order to start large-scale mining operations. Brewster evidently found that out. And figured if he could get hold of your claim, he could resell to us for a quick profit. Well, all's well that ends well. That's what I always say. Art, I guess you and me better be on our way. Yeah, let's go. Why, someone's coming. Maybe that's Ed now, getting back from town. It is Ed, and there's a mounty with him. What's that? What? What's the matter? Get your hands up, all of it. <laughs> what is it? Now, see here, what's the meaning of this? Shut up and start reaching before I plug you. All of you get over there and line up against the wall. Go on, get moving and swing. Art, right, you keep him covered. I'll handle the mountain. Right. 
Reach, pull here. Better watch that dog of yours, Mounty. One false move, and I'll put a bullet in his head. Steady, King. Elmar, I advise you to put that gun down. You're in trouble enough without adding any more violence to your record. Oh, make me laugh. Unbuckle that gun belt of yours and throw it on the ground. And if I refuse? You better not refuse. My partner's holding a gun on four people inside this cabin, including Russell's wife and kid. You try any funny stuff and they'll both get plugged. All right. For the moment, you have the upper hand. But I warn you, you're making a bad mistake. You let me worry about that. Hey, Max. Yeah, what do you want? That woodshed out back's got a good strong bar on it. We can lock them in there while we make our getaway. Good idea. I'll herd these two guys back there. You follow up with the rest of them. Right. A few moments later, the prisoners had been herded into the woodshed and the crooks prepared to shut them in. Now remember, we got guns and you guys haven't. So don't try busting out before we make our getaway. We'll spray you with lead. All right, Art. Shut the door. We lock them in. Right. The prisoners waited for several moments in tense silence until they heard the muffled barking of huskies as the crooks prepared to drive away. Then the sergeant put his shoulder against the door and heaved with all his strength. But the door refused to give. Again the sergeant tried, this time drawing back several paces and hurling himself against the door as hard as possible. Still without success. Here, let me try it with you, sergeant. Maybe the two of us can do it. All right. Together now. Again and again, the two men hurled their weight against the door. But although the wood splintered slightly, the door still refused to give. Finally, Ed said, It's no use, Sergeant. That two-by-four the door's barred with is too strong. We'll have to chop our way out. We must have an axe in here somewhere, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. I was forgetting all about that. It's right back here in the corner. Hand it to me, Ed. Here you are. Thanks. All right, you people, stand back, please. All right. All right. <laughs> the door was built of thick planks. But finally, the sergeant chopped a hole through which he could put his arm. That does it. I'll reach through and unbar the door from the outside. As the prisoners rushed out of the shed and ran around to the front of the cabin, they were greeted by the sight of huskies, trailing lengths of harness, snarling and fighting among themselves. They've got the traces on our sleds. I have an extra harness inside the cabin, Sergeant. I'll go get it. Right. Hey, look here, Sergeant. Will you kindly explain to me what this is all about? I just made a deal with those two crooks for $20,000. What kind of a deal are you talking about? I bought this claim from them. I'm afraid you paid the money to the wrong party. Uh, what do you mean? They bought the claim from Ed Russell with counterfeit money, so the deed of sale wasn't valid. The claim still belongs to Ed. Uh, what? Okay, Sergeant, here you go. Thanks, Ed. And while you're hitching up your team, I'm going over to Joe Carter's cabin and borrow another harness. Another harness? What for? So I can go with you. You'd better not, Ed. There's bound to be gunplay. No use arguing with me, Sergeant. You may need help handling those critters. Precious time was lost before the two teams were hitched up. But finally, the sergeant and Ed were ready to start. They'd have to clear enough trail to follow. Yes, they're heading north. If we cut over the hills, there's a chance we can intercept them. Oh, Ed, for heaven's sake, please be careful. Don't worry about me, honey. I'll be all right. Now, Tommy, you take care of your mother till I get back. I shall, Ed. All right, sergeant, let's go. All right. On King! On your husky! Rush! Rush, your husky! For nearly two hours, the sergeant and Ed urged their teams forward at desperate pace in pursuit of the crooks. Night had fallen, and the sky was brilliant with the full moon and the flashing northern lights when they finally topped the crest of a steep hill and sighted their quarry driving along the trail in the valley far below. There they go, Ed. On King! On your husband! With their sleds traveling at breakneck speed, the sergeant and Ed literally hurled down the hillside. The crooks were driving separate teams. Art Lust was in the rear. He turned and began firing wildly at the sergeant. Knowing the range was too great, the sergeant didn't bother to reply with his carbine. Finally, the crook's six shots were used up and the hammer clicked on an empty chamber. With a curse, he flung the now useless gun down on his sled. As the sergeant drew closer, he shouted to Lusk, Up in the name of the crown! Instead of stopping, Lusk urged down his team to greater efforts. The sergeant could have shot him, but it was against his nature and against the principles of the force. As they closed in, King raced ahead, intending to drag the crook from his sled. But the sergeant shouted, No, King, I'll take him. Up ahead, boy, and stop that other team. Instinctively, the great dog understood his master's command and raced forward in pursuit of the leading crook. A few moments later, the sergeant drew abreast of Art Lusk. He shouted to the team, oh, 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 oh. At the same time, he leaped at the crook, knocking oh. him from his sled. Oh, you won't take me, We'll Mary. see about that. The crook fought with desperate fury, <laughs> kicking and punching like a madman oh. as they struggled on the ground. But the sergeant, too, was driven by desperation. For King's sake, he had to finish the fight quickly. At that moment, Ed Russell arrived on the scene. Oh, you're not 
Get him out, Sergeant. Watch him, Ed. I'm going after the other one. The sergeant raced toward his team, which had halted several yards away. He jumped on the sled runners and cracked the whip. On you, Husky! Rush! By now, Delmar was far down the trail. The Mounties team strained forward at their master's command. Bit by bit, they closed the gap between the sergeant and his quarry. Meanwhile, King had nearly overtaken the crook. At the sound of his snarl, Delmar drew his gun and turned to take aim at the great dog. With lightning speed, the sergeant grabbed up his carbine and fired. With a scream of pain, Delmar clutched his arm and toppled from his sled. As he hit the ground, he tried to grab up his gun with his left hand, but King stopped him with a vicious slash of his fangs. The great dog was still standing over him menacingly when Sergeant Preston reached the scene. Oh, you have to... oh, good work, King. Be safe, Maudie. Get this dog away from me. Certainly, as soon as I pick up your gun. All right, King, I have it, boy. Let him up now. On your feet, Delmar. Bye. You and your partner are under arrest in the name of the Crown. Homer Dunlap was waiting at the cabin with Mrs. Russell and Tommy when Sergeant Preston and Ed returned with the two prisoners late that night. It's Daddy and Sergeant Preston. Oh, thank heavens you got back safely. Sure, honey. Oh. I told you not to worry. Inside, you two. All right, all right. Uh, Sergeant, did you get back my 20000 I haven't searched them yet, but they probably have the money with them. Don't worry, it's right here in my pocket. You mean they stole 20000 Oh, I forgot to tell you, Ed. This man bought your claim from Delmar and Lusk. Paid 20000 for it. What? But, of course, the deal wasn't valid. 20000 That's right. I represent the Ace Mining Company. If you're willing to sell the claim, I'll pay you the same price for it. Am I willing? <laughs> Holy mackerel, honey, we're rich. Oh, and Ed, how wonderful. Well, King, old boy, that seems to take care of everything. This case is closed. We now take you to Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters in Dawson. You sent for me, Inspector? Yes, Sergeant. There's been an outbreak of fur robberies all over the territory. Two trappers have been shot to death. It looks as though the same gang is responsible for all of the crimes. Well, I must have some way of disposing of the stolen furs. I suggest we check on all the fur trading companies, sir. The case is in your hands, Sergeant. I want that gang broken up and the criminals brought to justice. Right, sir. Come on, King. We have a big job ahead of us. Yes, the sergeant is taking on a big and dangerous assignment. He's up against a well-organized gang of fur thieves operating on a large scale. Somewhere in the background, there must be a master criminal planning every move. And the next move may be death for Sergeant Preston. Be sure to listen to this next exciting adventure, The Branded Pelts. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, supervised by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you once each week until September, when we shall resume our regular Monday, Wednesday, and Friday broadcasts. <laughs> This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until our next broadcast. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>